Hey beauties. Okay, so this is a video that I've been wanting to post for a long time on skin histology, on what skin looks like under the microscope, and the different components of the skin. Because I think a lot of uh, dermatologic terms are thrown out very loosely um, for marketing purposes, you know, talking about the basement membrane zone or the barrier or the acid mantle and things like this. And like, what does that actually even really mean? And I just wanted you guys to have a clearer understanding without getting too scientific or too microscopic in the detail um, and I'm gonna first start off with this video today I was thinking about having like a schematic or a histological slide that I could use to kind of illustrate just the epidermis and the different cellular layers of the epidermis and what role they play and in understanding this a little bit better you'll understand how skincare products get absorbed and how they stay molecularly stable and how they interact and affect different cell types in the skin especially in the epidermis whether you're talking about the keratinocytes or in the dermis where you have the fibroblasts that make the collagen and elastin you have your skin immune cells that come in, you have macrophages, you have all different types of cells that are ongoing and, and very active in the skin and they all play different roles and different areas of the skin have different uh, roles that they play as well too. So it really makes understanding skincare products and the way they work and even dermatologic and aesthetic treatments, how they work too. So um, as a Mohs micrographic surgeon myself, I spent decades looking at skin under the microscope and this is how I view skin. When I see it clinically, I think about what it looks like under the microscope. But when I see or hear about a treatment or a skincare product, I don't think about how it's gonna look clinically, but I think about how it's gonna affect the skin on a microscopic and histological level. And I want you to think that way too. So when you're talking about skin, skin has multiple components. And just to kind of keep it simplified, we're gonna be talking about the epidermis today. But the epidermis is the most superficial layer of the skin. When you're looking at a skin biopsy under the microscope, you have the uppermost epidermis, which is actually a small percentage of the thickness of the skin. Then you have the dermis, which is the papillary and reticular dermis, where you have all your extracellular matrix proteins like collagen and elastin, and that's what gives skin its tensile strength and structure. And a loss of those um, proteins can cause skin laxity, aging, wrinkles, fine lines, crepey skin, things like that. And then below the dermis, you have the subcutaneous fat, or some people call it the hypodermis, which has the vasculature, the blood vessels, and, um, and so forth. There's a lot of other components to it as well. But just to kind of compartmentalize, and today we're gonna to be focusing on the epidermis, not even talking about the dermis, but the epidermis is your first line defense. It is the barrier to the skin, uh, to the body. It keeps the outside world from coming into the body, largest organ in the body, and it's our, our body's immune and protective defense from the outside world and external factors coming in that can hurt us, harm us, or enter our bodies. So when you talk about the barrier, the epidermis in, in and of itself is a barrier, but when you look at the epidermis under the microscope, there's five distinct layers of the skin, and where does the barrier occur? Is it at the bottom? Is it in the middle? Is it at the top? What's it composed of? How do we strengthen it? How do we keep it healthy? So these are the, the questions that I'm gonna hopefully answer to, for you today, and after understanding you know a little bit more about the epidermal histology and cellular function, you'll understand a little bit more of these terms and how skincare products work and so forth. So when you're looking at under the microscope at skin, the epidermis can look different depending on the local, you know, the localized area of the skin that the biopsy was taken from. For instance, skin on the face, the epidermis looks a lot different than skin on the eyelid or the neck or the decollete or the back or the scalp or, you know, other areas of the body. So skin on the scalp is gonna have a lot more sebaceous glands and hair follicles. Skin on the eyelid is gonna have uh, more meibobian glands and other extracellular glands that don't exist in other areas of the face. And it's gonna have a very thin epidermis. Um, skin from the palms and soles has an extra layer called the stratum lucidum that more, you know, skin on the other areas of the body doesn't have. So it just depends on what location the skin was taken from. and different you know different factors age um exposures and you know skincare products things like that really can affect the skin histology as well so for all intents and purposes most skin has five layers now again, um, how many layers does the epidermis have but typically it's about five and the bottommost layer is the basal layer which are like the baby stem cells that give rise to mature keratinocytes that desquamate off later on and just kind of exfoliate. So basically when the baby skin cells are born, they mature over about four weeks and then they get sloughed off. Now in a young healthy adult or somebody who is 
older who actually uses great skincare products that transepidermal time, the time from a baby stem cell to be born and to exfoliate off is about four weeks. That slows down with aging, unfortunately, just like all other cells in our body, our immune cells, our neurologic cells, our um, you know, uh, musculoskeletal system, everything kind of slows down and becomes senescent with time. But in the skin that happens too, and the skin cells can start become becoming sluggish and senescent to where it takes them more like 50 days instead of 30 days to make their way from the bottom skin cell layer, the basal layer, to exfoliating off. And so when you increase that transepidermal time, you refresh the skin like a child's skin would look. That's why they have vibrant, you know, they have vibrant skin. It's usually kind of, you know, pink and, and vibrant and alive and not dull and dusky. And as we get older, the skin cells start to slow down. They stop making collagen, they stop renewing themselves and they slow down their transepidermal time. So you have kind of lingering dead skin cells at the stratum corneum layer on top that just kind of give a dull, listless look to the skin and a wrinkled you know, texture to the skin. But by stimulating transepidermal time and cellular renewal, you can make the skin look more vibrant and healthy and refreshed like a child's skin or a younger adult skin. So the basal cell layer are the stem cells of this, the epidermis that their job is to replenish and refresh the epidermis. They rest on the lowermost level of the epidermis closest to the dermis or the dermal epidermal junction where the basement membrane zone is. The next layer of cells above the basal layer of cells is the spinous layer. So this is called the stratum spinosum. And the reason why it's called the stratum spinosum is because these little cells have intracellular connections. They look like little arms and they look like they're holding hands and holding each other. They're called desmosomes and they kind of anchor themselves to their neighbor. And as they mature from the basal cells to the spinous cell layer, the stratum spinosum, they start to form little granules inside the cytoplasm of the cell. And these contain lipid and protein um, constituent organelles that basically get exocytose later and later on will form kind of the cement in between the cells that provide the bar at, barrier at the uppermost level of the skin. And the reason why they're called spinosum is because they look like little spines, so like little spiny cells. But it becomes important because these little desmosomes where the cells are kind of holding hands and linking onto each other, a lot of um, keratolytic active ingredients and in skincare products will lyse these, will basically cut them in half so that the cells are not adherent to each other and will help um, uh, induce you know, desquamation of the skin or um, exfoliation of the skin. So alpha hydroxy acids like lactic acid, um, glycolic acid, peels, chemical peels, and even skincare products that contain AHAs and BHAs will lyse or cut these desmosomes, which are the intracellular bridges that are holding the cells together so that they can kind of mature and desquamate faster to re increase cellular renewal and refresh the skin. Talk to you guys, I talk to you guys in scientific terms, just as intercollegiate physicians talk to other physicians. So the scientific term for lice just means to cut or to cleave. You'll hear me talk about um, cleaving or lysing, that just means cutting two things apart. So in case you hadn't heard that term lice, that's what that means. Um, and then uh, moving on, so after we just talked about the stratum spinosum, the next layer, most superficial above that, as the stratum spinosum cells mature to the next level, that's called the stratum granulosum layer. So the stratum granulosum layer um, contains um, compacted flattened cells that contain these keratal hyaline granules. So it looks granular under the microscope. It looks like these intracellular um, little balls inside the cytoplasm of the cells. And what those little balls contain are um, keratohyaline granules. Keratohyaline is the lipid protein complexes that basically get released outside the cells and, and form the mortar, if you will, um, for the brick and mortar barrier of the epidermis. So if you think about the cells as the bricks and the intracellular space with the cement is the mortar, that is the keratohyaline granules that get excreted from the cells that are produced by the cells that kind of fill in the gaps in between the cells and provide this protective barrier to minimize transepidermal water loss, to maintain hydration in the skin, and to protect your skin from outside forces coming in. People with um, atopic dermatitis or eczema have something called a filaggrin defect, and so one of the genes in this barrier is, de is defective, and so that's why they have outside allergens coming in and revving up the skin's immune responses to um, have, you know, we call it the itch that rashes, because allergens can get in through that broken barrier, it elicits an immune response, you scratch more, and then that breaks the barrier open more, and then more allergens come in and it can be a vicious cycle. So we learn a lot about the epidermal barrier from our atopic and eczematous patients as well. 
really under it's really important to understand you know we hear the word barrier thrown around but where is that the epidermal dermal junction is it at the stratum granulosum layer that's where it resides right underneath the stratum corneum so that brings us to the next layer of the epidermis which is the stratum corneum so above the stratum granulosum you have the stratum corneum now the stratum corneum actually doesn't have any viable live cells all those cells are dead they're keratin they're keratinized or corneocytes is what we call them in dermatology they've lost their intracellular nuclei they're basically just dead bodies that are just sitting on the um, uppermost superficial layer of the skin to protect as um, a barrier reinforcement from the outside forces coming in now as we said as I explained earlier today people who are older or have more sluggish skin and their skin cells aren't active and and young acting they can kind of pile up and give that dull listless look to the skin so although you do want a stratum corneum to protect your skin from the outside forces coming in you also don't want it so thick or hyperkeratotic that you have wrinkles and texture and dullness and brown spots and you have time for melanin to accumulate unevenly and that's why you get sunspots and melasma and you get uh, dyschromia and you get kind of like a textured dull listless look to your skin so it's a happy medium you want your stratum corneum to be healthy and you want enough layers to protect it but you don't want it too much to where it's super thick and it and it doesn't look beautiful clinically so sometimes looking at people people's skin under the microscope I'll see them clinically and they have dull listless skin and under the microscope they have a really thick stratum corneum or I'll see patients who have been using a tretinoin or having laser resurfacing and their skin cells are super healthy they're super viable they're active they're producing collagen and elastin their cellular renewal and their epidermis is a little bit thinner their ba their barrier is still intact but it's lower it's lower than the uh, dead keratinocyte stratum corneum layer is so I hope that makes sense kind of gross but I teach the dermatology residents and medical students and they learn best by analogies so if you can think of as barbaric as this is like at a time of war when you have troops fighting you know on the front lines in, in a war or a battle where there's bullets flying around and bombs going off and you have all the dead corpses all the dead bodies you're putting those guys in front so the people who are still alive can can shoot and you know act beyond, behind this barrier of these like dead cells and dead corpses up in front that's kind of how the stratum corneum layer is the very uppermost portion of your skin that you're looking at when you look at your skin those are all dead skin cells that's why if you you know if you uh, scrape it off or you exfoliate it, those cells are dead there's no nerve endings there it doesn't hurt it's not going to do anything to the underlying you know structure of the skin unless it goes too deep or it's too harsh or abrasive and then you are getting down into the deeper layers of the epidermis or even to the dermis where it could be too harsh or abrasive so hearing terms like you know tretinoin disrupts the barrier um, it, it really has a lot to do with the formulation and using it correctly, but it should never disrupt the barrier. The barrier is a lot deeper than the stratum corneum layer is. It would have to be going into the stratum spinosum layer, and that's something that skincare products just topically just don't have the um, ability to do unless they're being used improperly or unless they're being combined with other laser treatments or other actives that are increasing their potency or their strength to um, make them damaging to the barrier. But when used um, as directed, as either prescribed by your dermatologist or provider, or just using um, cosmeceutical grade um, retin-A derivatives like um, retinol or retinaldehyde, it should never be enough to disrupt that barrier. So I hope this makes sense and I hope this wasn't too technical and I can do a similar video again where I actually have a histological slide of the epidermis and we point to all the different layers of the skin. But in summary, you have the stratum basal or the basal layer, then you have the stratum spinosum, then you have the stratum glandulosum, and then you have the stratum corneum, um, plus or minus the stratum lucidum if you're on the palms or soles or if you're on thicker skin. But when you talk about the barrier, just remember that the barrier mainly is, you know, the keratohyaline granules, the brick and mortar that have, you know, you have your, your bricks that are their cells, you have your cement or mortar in between the cells, you have to keep that healthy. That's usually um, made up of lipids and protein complexes, which are going to protect your outside world from entering the body it's also going to minimize evaporation of water from the skin so minimizing trans epidermal water loss which a lot of hydrators and moisturizers can do and then there's also you know different components of the of the skin and in the next video I can also talk about the dermis because that's kind of where all the action is in the skin with respect to rejuvenation and anti-aging stimulating those fibroblasts to make collagen and elastin and increasing hyaluronic acid which is the ground substance of our skin which gives it that kind of um, smooth texture a lack of all these 
these proteins or dysfunctional proteins in the extracellular matrix is what we see when we see wrinkles, you know, laxity, skin falling, sagging, opening up the, of, of the pores because of the, the collagen's not tight enough or not functional enough or not healthy enough. So I think when you think of it in terms of like what it looks like under the microscope, it really makes sense as to what it looks like clinically and knowing what those skin cells need and um, looking at the active ingredients and how to get those active ingredients to where they need to go to be effective and to keep them in a stable uh, molecular configuration is really, really important. So hopefully after watching this video, this will make sense. I'll have more videos similar to this if you guys like it. If it's too technical, technical or too um, scientific, um, I can do less or kind of water it down so it's not too um, technical in the language that I'm using. I hope this, I hope this makes sense. And um, maybe when you hear things like, the, you know, the stratum corneum or exfoliation or a barrier, it makes a little bit more sense after watching this video. Just in summary also, everything in medicine and life and science is about balance. So if you hear something about ruining your acid mantle, I mean, there, I guess it's um, considered acidic because the skin proteins um, function at a lower pH. And if you, you know, do too much exfoliation or use products that can disrupt the pH or the lipid balance um, of the barrier, it can be thrown off. But usually, you know, in moderation and doing it the right way, not being too overzealous or over aggressive in your skincare products, in your treatments, um, it all just depends on what you do at home, what products you're using, how often, and other factors too. Um, the altitude that you're in, how much humidity is in the air, what your diet contains of. Um, are you eating clean? Are you stressed out? What does your enzymatic profile look like? What does your home hormone profile look like? Because those these can all affect the skin too. So um, just keep that in mind. And um, when you see people posting on the barrier or the acid mantle, just remember it's all in flux and it's all in moderation. And when it's done correctly and um, very elegantly, um, we can have a lot of induced um, great healthy changes in the skin, but we don't want to do too much to where we're disrupting that barrier. I hope this helps you guys.